So welcome everybody. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Thanos Vostanis. I am a lecturer in intellectual and developmental disabilities and a board certified behavior analyst here at the Teaser Center. This is our first online journal club of this academic year. And the purpose of the journal club is to disseminate good practice in behavior analysis. And that's why we have monthly presentations from academics from all, all over the globe discussing their area of uh, research and expertise. We specialize in intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have two ABAI verified course sequences. If you want to study behavior analysis or positive behavior support at the postgraduate level. We also have a peer review journal. It's called the Tizard Learning Disability Review, and it focuses on publishing good practice on supporting people with learning disabilities. If any of your internationals, you might know them as intellectual disabilities. Same principle, really. It's just that we usually call them learning disabilities here in the United Kingdom. The purpose of TLDR, the Learning Disability Review, is to give you an opportunity to read about good clinical practice. So if any of you are working on any case studies or you would like to share good practice from your workplace, do not hesitate to uh, submit your work at TLDR. It's not the typical academic journal that would expect you to have engaged in the most rigorous research. That's not our purpose. We're not trying to compete with JABA or the Journal of Behavioral Education or Behavioral Interventions. The purpose of the journal is slightly different, and that's why I'm always prompting and urging people to do consider submitting their work because we would take it into a serious consideration and we would be keen to publish it. We also have uh, our Twitter and Facebook accounts. If you look up this art center, you will find us there. And I'm also going to be sharing some links for our mailing lists. If you want to keep track of what the Tizard Center is doing, you can sign up for those uh, mailing lists. And that way, you're going to be getting information about our next journal clubs, other opportunities, publications, our newsletter, and so on and so forth. OK, that's enough of me plugging Tizard. I am welcoming Dr. Maria Cholitz. If I pronounced it properly, using my uh, limited knowledge of Serbian, uh, but I, I, I hope it wasn't too bad, Maria. Um, she is um, going to be discussing today stigma in intellectual and developmental disabilities and also racism within applied behavior analysis. I have to say you guys are in for a treat. I have attended a workshop she delivered recently for the Standard Acceleration Society uh, during one of the precision teaching conferences. I was blown away and I've been using her training resources and the points she made throughout the training to teach the students uh, at the Tizard Center. And that's why I approached her and I said, you know what? I'm not going to be greedy. I'm not going to keep this to myself. You should um, disseminate your good work to other colleagues as well. So, Maria, thank you for joining us today. Could you, I, people already ha have already seen the flyer and your bio. So, could you just tell us a few things about what you're working on currently? And then feel free to share your screen and um, take it away. Oh, one last thing. Sorry. Guys, see, use, I'm going to say three keywords. Please note them down and at the end of the session and no later by the end of the week, I'm putting a limited hold on that schedule of reinforcement. Please email me with those three keywords, your full name as you want it on the certificate. And I will email you back uh, with some resources, hopefully Maria slides if she is able to share it with us and your certificate. OK, you can find my uh, email on the website, but I will also pop it in the chat. Maria. Tell us a few things about your current work. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Stanis, for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, as I you know, told you already, I'm really excited that you know the field is more interesting in stigma and racism and how can we support families and people we work with. Uh, so pretty much I will share probably the best to share my screen and then I can just briefly say uh, what I'm currently working on, but I believe you guys already saw the flyer. Um, okay, so do you see now? Yeah, you'll have the access. It's coming up. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, okay, um, so, so let's see. Also, there. Okay, here. 
So any case, uh, um, so one of my being interested really about stigma, and I kind of started working uh, more like a from social psychology side. And then as I'm also a BCBA and work with a family for a long time, somehow I was able to combine these two loves into one and try to kind of explore more what we uh, can do and how to approach uh, families indicated they might be facing stigma or racism as applied behavior um, uh, practitioners, like applied behavior analyst practitioners. So that's pretty much what I'm still interested in. And this uh, presentation today, um, it's really based on these two papers and also some of my uh, upcoming ideas that I would like to write a new paper. So I hope you guys will learn something new. So I will just say the first section probably will be a little more theoretical, just kind of understanding stigma and racism. And then from there on, I will move on to more applied and how we can actually use some of this knowledge in our practice. Okay, so uh, speaking of which then, when we talk stigma, maybe just open and try to briefly describe what uh, public stigma is. What I'm saying to try, because it's very complex phenomena overall. And I don't think we will have enough time here to actually go into depth to discuss each. But I would like to just kind of like an overall share with you some main information. And hopefully over time, you know, we will be more exposed to this terminology. And from there on being able to learn uh, like a, about different type of stigma. So in general, and this is really uh, taken from the Goffman, who was kind of like a god of the, you know, uh, stigma, because he back then uh, started 1963 to write about it. So pretty much if you find any paper that deals with stigma, you will most likely find his citation for his, um, his book. So we can think about stigma as an attribute that one possesses which discredits an individual in specific context and spoils one identity through its relationship with stereotypes. So now you might be wondering, okay, what does that mean? The simply put, and probably the easiest way to say would be that in specific society, a characteristic that maybe one member of the group possess for some reason produces a stigma, meaning people, the way that people uh, treat that person, the way people, um, a dreaded person will definitely be quite different than from general population, meaning they will most likely help have some stigmatized behavior. And I will talk more about it. Through example, might be easier to understand. So in that case, if we think about stigma, we can talk about three main characteristics or kind of like a, a part that we can uh, understand public stigma uh, better. So first one would be stereotype. So stereotype, as we all know, it's really a really negative beliefs about a stigmatized group. So in that case, we could think about, let's say people with mental illness, we can say, okay, well, people with mental illness are dangerous and they are probably not capable of holding a job, might not be safe to give them a job. So that can be just belief. A belief can be maybe about people with disability, well, people with disability, they cannot be a parent. People with disability cannot live um, independent life. People with disability cannot hold a steady job. So those are negative beliefs about a group. So now the second part would be a prejudice. So prejudice in that sense means that a general public agrees with these negative beliefs. So what does that mean? So in that case, we might be aware of some of these prejudices, but that doesn't mean we agree with those. So maybe we know, okay, well, in generally, people believe that, you know, general public believe that people with disability cannot have a family, but that's not what I believe. I think they can do. But if you do agree, let's say, we said, oh, I know that general public thinks, and I also agree. Yeah, they definitely cannot have a family. Then we are talking about prejudice. And then finally, the third part will be discrimination. And this is really negative behavior to prejudice. So in this particular case, 
if we talk about uh, as we said people with disability and we believe they cannot hold a um, they cannot hold a job or they cannot be a parent what like we will, we will behave in uh, relation to our prejudice meaning if we employee we are not going to give employer sorry we're not going to give them a job because we believe they cannot do it if we maybe work in some uh, social uh, services we also might not help them to um, uh, to fulfill their rights as a parent or maybe support them through the uh, parenting process or help them understand what will be the process to uh, you know obtain different rights because we believe they cannot be a parent so in that case like the discrimination is really final we can think about final step of the public stigma uh, if we think about these three components so this is probably a nutshell i would say and this is as we say, it's a public stigma. So stigma that people of general public hold towards a members of certain group. And what I'm saying in society, because not in each society, certain characteristics will be stigmatized. So maybe some society having a child with autism doesn't produce any stigma. But then again, there might be society that is highly uh, likely that families and people with let's say, autism will be uh, stigmatized. So it's really very sociological phenomenon in that sense and really depends on the culture. So now the second section I want to also talk about stigma would be really now, okay, we kind of understood what public stigma is. So how does now re re it's related to the families or overall? So I kind of made here some uh, kind of diagram hopefully to describe a little easier the process and my idea would be just kind of to go through each of these stigmas and describe what each of these mean and as I said it might sound a little complicated now because it's kind of a lot of new terms but kind of my hope is really about you know bringing to the field uh, more information about it and you know overall how feel grows and interest in this area grow that we will be more and more exposed and something we will eventually learn and be able to implement uh, in our own practice. So when we talk about experience stigma, we can just say that experience stigma refers to instances of rejection or discrimination experienced by a stigmatized individual. So in that case, uh, it's pretty much can be the parent, child, or family. So let's say maybe through the example might be easier. So if we talk about families of children, let's say with uh, disability can be autism, and imagine they go to the park, and now they're in the park, but nobody, uh, so nobody's playing with their child and other parents who are also in the park, they don't want to interact with the caregivers of the child with, let's say, autism. So they might look at them, uh, like uh, look at them, they might uh, try to move away, but they don't try to interact. So in that case, uh, the parents can feel that they experience stigma as some form of discrimination, maybe at the workplace. So let's say maybe all, all co worker invites. Uh, someone, you know, they have a party, so they in house party, they invite everybody, but they don't invite a parent of a child with autism, most likely because they heard about child having autism, maybe they know the child has um, some challenge behavior, so that also would be one form of experience stigma. So it's really about everything that parents in this, uh, experience in a form of discrimination, rejection, um, avoidance, so really negative behaviors. And then we have here, I kind of try to do kind of new, it's not like a circle eclipse, in trying to put these two stigmas and say they're within parents. So meaning there's something that parents feel, uh, they believe, they think. So first one would be perceived stigma. And perceived stigma is very interesting type. The reason why, because sometimes uh, we might not even be aware of uh, you know, perceived presence of perceived stigma, but actually it affects a lot uh, parent uh, behavior. 
So in that sense, we can think about perceived stigma as parents' beliefs of public negative attitudes that can be towards themselves, their child, or the family. So if we think about, let's say, example with experience stigma and going to the park, if parents believe that they will be discriminated against in the park, they most likely will uh, start uh, avoiding going to the park with their child. If they maybe feel that they might be discriminated in the, uh, let's say, mall, in the different stores or the restaurant, they most likely will stop going there. So the reason, so why? Because it can be because they might in the past, they maybe did experience stigma or discrimination, as we said, in those certain places. So if they already were exposed to negative treatment, why are they going to go back again? Well, obviously they don't. So they try to protect themselves and their child from really harmful um, events. So that is one way that we can think about perceived stigma. Set, like a development. Second way would be through socialization because each of us obviously is a member of community and society. So how we grow, how we uh, socialize, we learn about different attitudes and different values in the group we belong to. So in this particular case, even before parents become a parent, uh, they are learning and about uh, what public thinks about people with disability, people with mental illness, parents of child with disability. So they might think, uh, maybe society, in society they say, oh, for parents, they have a this child with, or let's say, autism, or maybe they said like, oh, look, this parent is not good enough because the child is having a tantrum all over, they spoil the child. Uh, they also can have, as we were talking already uh, here, so everything really what public, in that sense, like a public stigma um, is, they might believe like, oh, people with disability, they cannot have a family, they cannot have a job. So we learn that while we're growing up. So one moment, a parent become a parent of a child with autism, obviously everything that that person learned through socialization is still there. So in that case, they might not even try to change anything or to do anything to go different places because of something they already had in the past, it's something they learned. So this is perceived. So in that case, it doesn't mean necessarily that parents experience stigma. Maybe they never experienced. But still is there, still is there. And that I said through most likely then through socialization. Maybe as well they heard from other families of um, individuals with disability about some negative treatment they had. So pretty much it's something that parents believe, but I said it's not just like a vague belief, like they believe something that doesn't have any substance. It's really based on some of these two factors. And then finally, the third one is affiliate stigma. And now affiliate stigma, we, maybe we can think about easier way to think about internalized stigma. So in that case, it's really internalization of public negative attitudes towards people who have close connection with a primarily stigmatized person. So in that case, parents now start believing in what actually public believes and most likely through uh, some of these elements here. So in that case, if public believe the child, the parents are not good parents because the child have a tantrum, meaning they could raise child better, they could uh, behave better when they when they with a the child with community. Parents can actually really start believing that that's true. So in that case, kind of like a negative application of um, stigmatized attitude to own self, and it's really feeling like stigma really lead to social exclusion. So if parents internalize all these attitudes, uh, it's most likely they will really try to avoid different places. And it's very it's con uh, related to the higher depression, lower self-esteem, and overall lower quality of life. So as we all know, in ABA, you really care about quality of life. So that's something we kind of want to keep in mind and really try to understand what parents might be going through uh, in the same time when we come to support them with our treatment. Maria, could I just jump in there to deliver the first keyword? Our first keyword is stigma. 
I repeat our first keyword if you're claiming C use is stigma. Guys, if you've got questions, do not hesitate to pop them in the chat box and I will read them out for you to Marie. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so the second term that um, I kind of want to briefly discuss would be racism. And in that sense, we can think about racism that represents ideologies and their resultant practices that introduce racial inferiority and superiority. And really, we can think about race as one socially constructed belief that we can divide a human race into some biologically discrete and exclusive groups. Obviously, as we said, it's, uh, it's not something that actually exists. It's really what uh, certain society uh, made and uh, constantly just uh, unfortunately brings a lot of um, it, it brings a lot of negative experiences to the different uh, different groups. We can talk about mainly two types of racism, institutionalized um, and individual uh, individual racism. So institutional racism, some people will uh, sometimes you might refer as systemic racism. It's really manifested mostly through unequal access to both materials and some, source, uh, some other resources such as education, employment, uh, advocacy for people of color mainly. Um, and for individual racism, it can be both intentional and unintentional. And mostly it's coming from you know, our own in the terms of person and can be manifested some way of disrespect the evaluation and dehumanization. So one thing, now this is really beyond this presentation, I just kind of wanted to put very briefly here, so maybe we as practitioners start really thinking more about implicit biases that we have, because those will be really unintended biases that we are not aware and that are pretty much lead to discriminatory behavior. And it's obviously we're not aware, so it's a hard to uh, address, but there are some ways we could do it. And there are, uh, you know, we actually that um, in that like our presentation, we really talk about, you know, using uh, culture humility and different questions that we could reflect when we meet with a family. Uh, so if anyone is interested, there are like uh, in different papers, we little talk about black papers, how we can do um, with black caregivers. Uh, how we can um, actually support them. So that's something interesting. And definitely, if you do have resources to find about this, send some training and get some education would be great because it really will help a lot when working with our, our families. And some kind of conclusion in that sense, we can say that race is a stigma. Because, as we said, it's really just like a... a socially constructed belief. So there is nothing realistically that some race, some people different because of the, you know, their physical, cultural, social classification. So we can really argue that in that sense, the race already is a stigma. And if we think about, let's say, black caregivers as we had in our paper, so they might most likely already experience racism because of their color. But in the same time, if they do have a child with disability or autism, they might then again this, uh, experience like a, a stigma on that set. So we could think about racism as a double stigma if we think about, as we said, family who have a child with disability. So they're kind of, you know, and obviously this family will need much more support from us as practitioners because we want to take into consideration uh, everything they might be going through and facing. So now we might be wondering, okay, we learned Lila uh, her, or he heard Lila about stigma and racism. So why stigma and racism are important for ABA? Why do we know, need to know such a vague social constructs? Well, they're really important because as we know, we deal with the people, we work with the people, we wanna really address a behavior that is socially significant. We ultimately want to improve quality of life. So in order to achieve all of that, we have to have 
like a program acceptance and adherence to the treatment plan by caregivers. Because if parents don't follow our plan, if they don't accept it, there will not be any improvement in their child's life, in their own life, and all our intervention that we work on are just then meaningful in that sense. So in that case, if we do understand really what parents have been experienced and what what the potential situation could lead to um, stigma or could produce stigma, we could actually protect families and make the best plan in that sense. So I will kind of go through some examples. And in this second part, I will really explain how we can work on this and why this is important for us to know. So let's think about one example here. So we have an immigrant family that is coming from society in which people with disability are highly stigmatized. How will they accept community programs? So we can think that this family is come, it maybe came to US, so which is really very often supportive uh, and has so many different resources to support families. But one thing that family maybe still carry from um, you know, their own society might be perceived stigma. So, and we remember perceived stigma is parental beliefs about negative attitudes of the public. So in that case, although they may be now live in society that is not, that does not stigmatize people with disabilities in their families, they still carry whatever they learn through socialization from the place they're coming from. So if we now as practitioners come and we said, okay, I think we want to work on community goals. Uh, let's say we want to teach a child to do shopping because it's age appropriate and it's something he does need to learn. This particular family might be afraid to do it. My doesn't wanna, uh, my doesn't want to do that program. Uh, might be resistant to your intervention plan. Uh, so if we just suggest without actually taking in consideration what they feel and think, uh, as we all know, uh, there we always see social there would not be social validity, and they will probably most likely not going through. Even if they do with us, maybe once a month, they are not going to do that by themselves. So in the second part, I will talk about some strategy how we can actually address. But I want to hear maybe just to spark like our attention here about some situation that we find very common but other uh, people and maybe families coming from different uh, culture background they do not see the same with the same eyes so in this particular case perceived stigma could affect a lot the way they approach our treatment and accept it the second for example we have rbt in community setting Maybe RBT is playing soccer. So for us, again, coming from, you know, in, you know, live in a Western part of the world, we'd be like, yeah, why not? There is a dog who is there and helping a student, helping a, a child to be better at soccer. But from family's perspective, maybe uh, that is uh, some way stigmatizing because think about none of other children in that group will have adults who is running next to them or giving them instruction or giving them prompt so it's only their child so although we might do want to have this goal we need to take into consideration what parents feel about it and then from there on we will need to find a way how to support so maybe starting a um, soccer practice at home maybe be in, they have like a yard or maybe some like a park when there are not a lot of people maybe with rbt only after that maybe we introduce one um one uh, cousin so we now have two peers in rbt eventually until we are able maybe to fade in more peers or fade out rbt but in any case it's really important to understand whether some of these situation might uh, for families, they might feel that uh, could be stigma could lead to stigma stigmatizing experiences of their child and themselves. So before us just saying we're going to work on any of these strategies, let, let's actually understand what family thinks and then work from there.
And similarly, we might have a client that might does require to wear helmet and headphones. The same would be as we have to this one for maybe that parents perceive that child will be stigmatized because it's very visible if someone had helmet or headphones in a community. So although that might be the best treatment plan that we believe it is based on our evidence-based strategies, or, uh, but it doesn't mean it would be the most efficient for this family. Because if they don't adhere, they accept our plan and we know they're not going to do it. So they might do sometimes why we are with them, but all the other time with all the community, they are not actually, they will not wear helmet or headphones. So in that case, again, we will need to, as practitioners, really take that step back and understand, okay, what can I do then instead? Is there some way that we can address these behaviors without using any equipment? How we can do it? If we do need to use equipment, could we maybe do some shaping program that we slowly introduce? Could we work with the families as well uh, in understanding why their concerns are? Uh, is there something you know we could help them to uh, accept uh, accept better? Or I said, if it's in some community really hard to accept, really working around and finding the other plan that will work for the family. We can also think about um, like example, that might be we have black families and uh, white therapists. So in that case, and as we will also learn later, the black families might have some ex negative experiences so far with a white provider because they experience racism. So how that will affect now uh, when they work with the white therapist work with their child, will they share everything? Will they still be, um, will they still hold back something because of their fear they might again um, be discriminated in some way? So we really wanna as provider take that into consideration and see if we could address and help families. So these are just some examples, obviously there's so many, but idea behind all of this would be instead of us just going and prescribing a treatment plan, writing our intervention, writing goals based on our own belief, based on our standardized assessment, and we know they're standardizing the Western population. Let's actually have discussion with the families about each of these plans, each of these goals, each of these interventions, and then see what they feel about it and how we can as a team work together. And that pretty much would be now segue to my next section, next part. It's really some strategies to work with diverse families. So some of those first would be we want to assess stigma. We want to continue learning about the family's culture and we want to build rapport. These are not, these strategy are, it's not like a definite list. There's so many other things we can work on. I chose this one based on today's presentation and maybe something I felt would be the most relevant, but there are definitely much more in our uh, paper, like a, a, with our Black caregivers, we discuss different strategies that pretty much also include some of these. So first step would be to set stigma. And I have just to say, it's not obviously easy to do it because the topic is very sensitive. In most cases, parents might not even understand if we ask them, did you experience stigma? In most of the cases, it would not be even appropriate for us to say something like that or ask something like that directly. But, I, but as we already discussed, it is important for our own treatment to know about it. So what we could do, um, it's really to try to indirectly assess their experiences and parental own beliefs uh, they, whether how they feel about different uh, about about different places, different people, different situation, and whether they might were ex they, maybe they did experience stigma so so far. So I would kind of like to give some ideas, and we can discuss. But we really want to be sensitive. 
So when we start talking about it and even try to ask any question, if we do see that parents may show any sign on discomfort, maybe the way they look, maybe how much they talk about us, maybe how much they share, we should probably stop at that moment because we don't want to um, put any stress on the family. Uh, the good thing is, as we know, we continue work with the families. It's not like we see them once and it's done. No, we see them every week. So in that case, we have opportunity to continue assessing stigma every time we see families, based what they share with us what happened last week, based what they think about their plan. So some ways we could kind of assess, we could ask, are there some barriers in treatment implementation? So in that case, we want to understand, um, we want to understand better if they feel that maybe some things might not be appropriate in that case. They might share with us that um, they don't have opportunity to go to community, or maybe they don't have um, opportunity to, uh, you know, do a different program that in that might include uh, other other children in that sense. Also, one really good way that we could assess. It's really, do parents feel comfortable having session of community? So we could ask them, okay, I think your child might be benefit from the shopping goal. So do you feel that that would be a good goal for you? Would you like that we work on something like that? So that would be indirect way to actually get some of information we want. Uh, we can also ask them, okay, what do you think? Would you like that we have some session outside? Okay, so we could, that could be one way. We could ask them, um, is there something uh, specifically that we would like to work in community or maybe some social skills? Um, we can ask them, okay, in the past, did you maybe try some of these uh, community goals? By, I mean, goals, I don't say goals, but did you maybe try something to go shopping with your child? Did you maybe try to, did your child go to some practices uh, with other peers? Okay, perfect. So how that went? What was your experience? Did you like it? What do you think about the child? Did your child enjoy it? So these are all indirect ways that we could actually ask them about their previous experiences and what they believe. We could also like indirectly ask about their preferences about therapists. Okay, so uh, we might be able to, um, you know, to choose a therapist. If you have some preference, who would, who would you be, feel more comfortable to work with your child? We could also listen how they describe different community helpers. In that sense, okay, how about the, the evaluation of the teacher? What would they say? Uh, because some of those reflections might point to the stigma. It could be experience that they've really experienced stigma, like let's say the teacher never uh, shared with them uh, what child is working on that day. Yeah. Or, the, or maybe a doctor never took into consideration what they're saying, but rather just prescribe whatever and said why. So we would be able then to understand better how we can position ourselves in that relationship, how we can assess it, we said like a stigma, and then based on that, work on the goals. So that would be, as we had like earlier um, about Perceive, uh, that example with immigrant families that uh, might have perceived stigma of how their child will be seen in um, while doing shopping. So this is something, a good way before even start doing to assess. The reason why a lot of families uh, will not directly say, no, I don't want you to do it. Because as we know, they're waiting for the therapy for so long. So finally, when they get someone there, they want to keep it and they, most of them are you know, in fear that they might be losing if they don't follow whatever we are saying. In that case, and think about it, they said all the previous history they had with different healthcare providers, um, if they were already discriminated, if they did experience racism, so that's all accumulating. So some of them I don't even say directly, but you could notice if they're not in agreement with your goals because they don't they may be always find some excuses to not go out or they may be find excuses like oh maybe we can go you know do this 
next one. So maybe in some way the parents would like to work, but they don't still feel comfortable. And that's okay. Then it's if that's the case, then it's okay and it's better to maybe then have you know once a month, one to two months when they feel comfortable, and then slowly fade in programs, uh, meaning like a frequency of the program as the family becomes more comfortable. So we don't want to push anyone because we all know we don't want to like <laughs> we don't want to be pushed. So why then to do someone uh, to someone else? It's really about just taking that step back, looking at the family as a whole, looking at the people we're working with and trying to support because they are probably going through a lot of uh, hard and difficult situations. So we don't want to bring one more burden on their back. So each family is different. And that's why we want to assess differently each, to each family. Could I just jump in there to say our second key word is sensitive. Our second key word is sensitive. Thank you. OK, so the <coughs> sorry, guys. OK, so the second strategy we could apply would be really continue learning about the family's culture. So first to understand, as we said, culture is beyond race in that sense. And we don't, as we said, you know, is there a race at all? So we want to understand what family is actually coming from. Uh, in that sense, as we said, each family is really unique. Um, and we never can make some assumption or stereotype, oh, this family is coming from this country. This is how it's supposed to work because everyone has really individual like a constellation of culture characteristics. So in that case, we want to approach uh, the family uh, very um, particularly and understand where they're coming from. Um, some groups might have different understanding on disabilities. And we, the provider, in that sense, we kind of want to help them understand it we what ABA can do and what we do instead of just being like oh well my child has autism and because of that my child cannot put shoes on let's explain more and trying to use obviously a language that parents will um, understand and that will be um, easy for them to also grasp what ABA is there and how to help um, one thing, everyone belongs to different socioeconomic groups. So now we as a provider, we, as we were talking at the beginning, we have again to be aware of our own biases. The reason why, because uh, we want to really remove whatever we might believe about certain groups and come to and approach everyone equally. Uh, but in the same times, we want to understand that some families, they maybe don't have enough resources for the treatment option we suggest. They might not be, uh, they, we maybe want to use, uh, let's say, iPad in the programming, but parents doesn't have resources. Or maybe we want to buy different reinforcers, but maybe the budget for the family doesn't allow to buy that for daily or weekly usage. But if we are aware of those, we don't want to provide to give provide families an impression that we discriminate them or we believe they are just belong us or they are not they don't care for their child. So if that's the case before even suggesting intervention. Let's understand more what family uh, has, what type of resources, and that again can be indirectly, as we were saying earlier. If we need that uh, with iPad, we can, instead of asking, oh, would be great if you can buy, I, uh, buy iPad, we can say, okay, well, we have different pro, different ways to teach this, let's say, matching program. So I could bring some puzzle, or maybe in some cases we use iPad, you know, but what do you feel about, would you pref which mode of learning you would prefer? So in that case, uh, parents, again, 
feel free to say, well, I think we maybe we start with your uh, puzzle because that might be good for beginning. So they don't have to say, oh, I don't have resources to buy iPad. So we give them a choice. So we don't want uh, to really create that like a that like a prejudice and overall discrimination towards families. And as we said, the last thing we want is a family perceive stigma from uh, from us as a provider. So really, in that case, we try to be very supportive um, and uh, really supportive and understand each of the family. And then one most a very important strategy is really building rapport with family. And we know this is so, so important with our client. And is the same is so so important with families. So one thing is really understanding like a family history. So in that case, if the family already had experience of racism, how actually that history impacted issues such maybe as coping, a self-esteem, trust with providers. Because if they don't trust us, as we said, why they will even go to work on any goal that they might feel is going to bring some negative experience to them. So they need to trust that what we suggest aligns with their belief, aligns with their values, and they do want to really go for it. And in that relation, it's really about understanding uh, how history of stigma and racism impacted their attitudes towards provider. So this is like a really important because again, if we look into let's say black, black caregivers in our paper, they had so much history of racism with healthcare providers. So now every new healthcare provider come, well, like let's say a therapist, they already have some uh, most likely, not just like a specific beliefs, and that's as we said, some perceived stigma is already there. And because of that, well, are they going to trust us? Mm, most likely no. Why? Because they already had so much negative experience that says why we are different. So we need in working and maybe the beginning that report might not be, maybe the parents are not as open to us as we might expect it, but they should not fool us and you know, lead to be like, oh, this family is rude. I don't want to work with them. No, let's really understand, okay, this, and think about this family might really went through some tough time, what I can do to support them. So how can they know that I'm there to actually, yeah, they have to really support child to support them. So one of the great way to do it to really listen to them. So let's listen to what parents say. And what are the expectations regarding treatment. And this is, again, in the paper with the black caregivers was one of the most reported issue that they had with a healthcare provider, just they didn't listen. So whatever parents say, they were just disregarding or ignoring. And that a lot of time, just parents then, and some of them said, I don't go by blueprint. I just do what I want because they don't completely uh, agree with the treatment. And in that case, we, in, you know, we as the practitioners, we, I mean, our treatment ultimately will not be successful if we don't actually develop calls based on what family needs and believe. So we can really ask them when we just meet it at the first time and ongoing. So what are you, what do you expect from the treatment? So let's say, um, what goals would you like that we work on? Where do you feel uh, comfortable to have sessions? For example, would you like that we have sessions at your home? Maybe in community, you can suggest some places. Would you be okay that we have some play dates? Um, so those are some ideas that we could actually ask them. You know, 
how they do. And, and we already discussed when we had those examples, if we are able to listen and understand history of stigma they had, and we said maybe they perceive stigma. Okay, so what are some ways that we could actually uh, slowly introduce this program and still help the child, but help family in the same way? So instead of pushing, really working as a team, taking into consideration what family believes and then really, really going together. And in that case and conclusion, do we need to understand stigma for successful ABA? Yes, I really strongly believe we do because we don't work with a machines or robot, we work with the humans. The humans who obviously have, have a feeling, the humans who went through different experiences, the uh, people who, because of those ex maybe negative experiences, they stop themselves from uh, doing some activity that we said, just limiting opportunities uh, for uh, for themselves and their child. And the research do show that very often perceived stigma is associated with a lower child engagement with their peers. So that's like, a, it's a, there is one research, a green, Sarah Green, that she did a lot of research on stigma. So that, for example, the conclusion of her, of her research, it's really a fact. It's not isolated thing that maybe just exists somewhere else. It's really like a stigma, it's very interconnected. All these types of stigma, they're interconnected and they really affect how parents will ultimately perceive our goals and whether they will accept. So before we just go and do assessment and suggest plan our goals without discussing with the families, let's, let's really discuss together with them using some indirect ways to um, to learn and assess what they feel about the goals. And then as a team, making the best uh, plan for their child. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I hope uh, you enjoy. And if you do have any question, you can always email me. And maybe I think we have a couple minutes for the question uh, today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Guys, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. And actually, let me bring up the chat so I can have a look. We've got some people saying thank you. Your last key word is going to be listen. I repeat, your last key word is going to be listen. So that's the third key word. Please do email me, at, pop my email in the chat box. Email me the three key words by the end of the week and I will send you your CEU certificate. Have we got any questions? I certainly took more notes, Maria. I think you're enforcing my behavior too much here. Um, <laughs> I, I remember scribbling as fast as I could last time I attended your training and it was the same thing now. I was trying to tweet while taking notes, while monitoring the chat. So it goes to show how interesting it was. Um, one of our uh, attendees says really interesting and very important Thank you for raising the topic. Thank Glad you. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, and I think, you know, thank you. Oh, we've got, I think Hwala. we've got some Serbian going on there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, very good. I think yeah, I, that's what I, I really think it's, I mean, it's, as I said, it's a lot in that sense. I mean, this is so complex topic and we cannot just in one hour. I really kind of tried to give some overview and as we said, hopefully, with more and more about being interested in this topic, we can make a better strategies and we can address things better. Because now, um, in that case, like in the early stage of uh, just introducing all of that, obviously the ideas are, might not be as big as they will be, you know, when more people come and more people in, be involved. So. Excellent. Yes, it's a, it's a line of research that I think is going to be very important. It, it's always been really important, but I think especially for behavior analysis, it was slightly underappreciated uh, at first, but I think we're, we're becoming a bit more sensitive about these things. 
Um, we've got a comment. I think the findings can be applied to increasing compliance with any type of treatment. Racism and stigma have a complex and unseen impact on people's lives. Thank you, Maria. Um, another comment says, thank you, Maria. That was wonderful. So many things to consider in, in our own professional practices. Learning never stops after passing the exam. Oh, that's that's for sure, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. I, I agree. I mean, the findings, you know, uh, in that sense, we want to increase treatment compliance. So that's for sure. And uh, sometimes, and that's it, because we don't, while we are, you know, becoming BCB, we don't talk about this stuff. So we really are very technologically in that sense. But uh, again, as, you know, as Lorraine said, it's really important because you have like a, that kind of complex and unseen impacts. I like how you put that. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> exactly. Never stop learning. <laughs> That's true.